The next couple of sections we'll get into some analytic geometry. I think the first section we come across is that of a algebraic definition of a line in terms of coordinates. <coughs> and the one after that is in terms of an algebraic definition of a plane. The first one requires the notion of parallel or direction. The second one requires the notion of perpendicular. And the thing we just came across, in fact, we'll do a few more examples today, a so-called vector or cross product is just the item we need in order to make those derivations. So let's take a look at some of those problems that you have, exercises. And I picked one out of that section, page 651. Uh, basically, it's number 12 with a few other ideas thrown in just to give you a, a more complete look at what we're trying to do here. Well, three vectors, three space. Uh, you could try to draw these. Let's make an attempt at a couple of them anyway. First vector, uh, 2 times i, 0, j, 1, k. It's kind of pointing out at us in this pers particular perspective. That's the a vector. The b vector goes back minus 3 in the x direction. 1 in the y direction stays within the x, y plane. So it's pointing back there somewhere. And the c vector comes out 1 unit forward, negative 2 units to the left and plus four units up. Let's kind of put it about right there. There's the C vector. Now, a couple of things that we're supposed to do is make some cross products. The first one, what happens if you cross A with B? Well, let's do it in terms of, again, the geometry. As I said before, A cross B is a vector. It's perpendicular to A and to be in the right-hand sense. That's at least a, a direction for magnitude. It's length is the length of A times the length of B. And this is the unfortunate part. It sounds like a dot product, but you're supposed to put a sign in there, the sign of the angle in between. So again, in terms of geometry, we have both a direction given here and a magnitude secondly. But that's no help. I mean, that's, that's fine. It kind of gives you an idea of what's going on here, but it doesn't tell you exactly what vector we're talking about. It gives me a little bit of a check on what's it, what it's going to look like. Now, this, this direction perpendicular to A and B in the right-hand sense says that if I take my right hand and let the fingers point in the direction of A and then sweep into the direction of B, my right thumb will be pointing in the direction of A cross B. So I do know that from my picture. A cross B will be a vector perpendicular in that direction. A cross B points our vector up that way. And the length is length of A times length of B times sine of the angle in between. But specifically, that is, still doesn't help me any, because here are my vectors. I could figure out A length, B length, the sine of the angle in between. I could do that with a dot product, for example. Remember, uh, theta, if you needed it, would be A dot B uh, divided by the length of A and the length of B, and then take the inverse cosine of that. That would be the angle in between, which we saw from the dot product. So you could generate these things, but still it doesn't give you, at least as I've stated it so far, A cross B is something I plus something J plus something K. It doesn't give you that nice specific answer. What I did last time was pull out the notion of determinant and said you can use that as a mnemonic. Take a determinant, replace the first row by i, j, and k in those three positions. And now, let's just do a general situation. If these are the components of your a vector and these of your b vector, so this is what sits in front of i, j, and k, then this would be a handy implement to use to actually get the cross product. And again, if you recall what I told you about determinants, it's just a matter of doing a little arithmetic with this particular little object and out comes the answer. 
So let's start doing that homework problem over there. In that particular case, A cross B, setting it up as I just suggested, would look like this. This was A, 2, 0, 1, B was 1, minus 2, and 4. Get the wrong one. Yes, sorry, I got the C vector. Okay, so there's A and there's B. Now that I check back. And to expand this, as I suggested, um, if you remember how to do it for three by three determinants across the first row, this turns out to be a plus I vector times its minor <coughs> minus the J vector times its minor. And we get that, if you remember, by crossing out J's column and row, what's left over is the minor of that particular vector. And lastly, it's a plus K times its minor, 2, 0, minus 3, and 1. So it, it begins to look like a vector anyway, and it's just a matter of figuring out what these numbers are. As two by two determinants, you may recall, I hope, that you take this diagonal from left to right product and subtract that diagonal product. So it's zero minus one. So we get a minus one i. We have a minus j here. Well, what do we have in front? This is going to be a two times zero or zero minus a minus three times one. Two negatives gives me a plus three. So it's a plus three. J, again with a negative sign out front. And for K, 2 minus 0 or just a 2. So the thing that I drew over there probably wasn't too, <coughs> too well drawn, specifically is this vector, minus I minus 3J plus 2K. At least I had the right direction. Notice that the k component is 2. And uh, again, as I've always suggested in problems, if there's a little bit of a check you could make, by all means do. And uh, I might recall for you that if you take a vector like a and dot it with a k vector, you're going to get the third component, the component in the k direction. Now what I'm doing is saying that uh, my vector a cross b, if dotted with k, is a plus 2. Indeed, my cross product that I've just computed does point upward, as it should. If it didn't, then I'd either worry about the picture I drew back here, or I'd worry about my computations over there. Okay, so a cross b, let me try to sneak it right in here. I may need it a little bit later on. That's what we came up with. How about A cross B minus C? Okay. Uh, without really doing that, what I wanted to do was to say that there are certain rules that are true about products. A cross B minus C, okay, you could get by taking that, uh, that difference and crossing it, or as you'll see in your book, there is a distributive property for the cross product, which is pretty much the one you would have guessed. A cross B minus A cross C, that turns out to be a an identity. And so, again, if uh, you happen to have this one, which we do, and if you happen to have this one, which we don't, but let's suppose that we did, obviously that would be a, 
a far superior solution to the problem than going through yet another cross product, a third cross product. So there is a list of rules there. You might look at them. I'm not suggesting that you actually sit and memorize them, but they give you a clue as to what is true. They also give you a clue as to what's false. Like if you look at this one right here, one gets into the feeling that, gee, all of these really are just plain old multiplications. So let's see, uh, I've got A cross B dot C. Well, if it's multiplication, then that should be the same thing as A cross B dot C. In other words, multiplication is multiplication, no matter how you look at it. Now, there is a very strong reason why that cannot be true. Can anyone spy what that might be without getting into any of really the specifics, without actually computing anything there? It's right. Right, exactly. So this is just a number, as we learned a, a section or two ago. And it doesn't make any sense to try to cross a vector with a number. I mean, you, you can talk about scalar multiplication, but that's not what the symbol indicates. So this thing over here is just a big fat question mark. It doesn't even make sense, let alone do you have equality. So you have to be wary. Sometimes those things uh, creep up on you. So again, it's not true. So Again, if you wanted to do this, a cross b dot c, uh, re you really have no choice other than actually doing it. Perhaps you can find an equivalent statement in the book, but I don't know that you'd save much time. You could take this vector right here, which you've just come up with, and dot it with a c vector, and that's it. Okay, so I guess to finish that one off, There's our cross product dotted with the C vector, which is given way over there, I minus 2J plus 4K. And from the old dot product scheme, that's just a negative 1 minus 1 times plus 1 plus a minus 3 times a minus 2 is a plus 6 plus a 2 times a 4 is a plus 8. Looks like we get 13. So again, uh, the thing on the left-hand side is a number. A cross B dot C is a number. The thing on the right-hand side doesn't even make sense. So uh, that's obviously not going to be an equality. Well, gee, uh, how about this one? A cross B, again, crossed with C. You think that's the same thing as a cross B crossed with C, parentheses moved over there. That's true. I'd be skeptical. Lots of things aren't true these days. Uh, in particular, the one I haven't really impressed upon you again is the classic that generally these are not the same vectors. In fact, the uh, one on the right, if you like, is the negative of the one on the left. It just happens to point in the wrong direction. So generally, it's the case that you don't have commutativity. All I'm asking for is uh, associativity. Can you associate the vectors in any way that you wish? My suspicion is that you cannot. And uh, I guess the way to do it is actually compute out some of this stuff. Now, thinking about it, I don't know if we want to do all of that. but. Uh, Let's get started on it. Maybe it won't look so bad once we get going. We have A cross B. Okay, so that we'll put back up here. And what we're looking for is A cross B now crossed with C. Okay, So that means, uh, again, let's copy down C over here again. This is I minus 2J plus 4K. That means we need yet another cross product, setting it up as before. This item right here would be A cross B comes in first with minus 1 
minus 3 and 2, and C in the second, or pardon me, the third row, is 1 minus 2 plus 4. It's well worth your time to sit there and make sure you copy the right things down. Um, you don't always have someone looking over your shoulder to help you out like you guys did earlier. Now, if you get pretty good at this, again, I've got you helping me, so I'm more confident. But if you get pretty good at this, you can do some of it in your head. I'm not saying everybody should. But if you've seen determinants before in high school or somewhere, uh, perhaps you can do it in your head and save yourself a little bit of time with a, a good chance of making mistakes, of course. If you try to do that, let's see if I can get myself into that frame of mind. First, start out with I, and it's its coefficient, its co component would be a negative 12 minus a minus 4. So that's negative 12 plus 4 looks like a negative 8. So we get a minus 8i. Now for j, remember we have to put a negative sign in anyway. Its minor is a negative 4, negative 2, negative 6, but with a negative sign already in front, we get a plus 6j, I think. And finally, for k, looking at its minor, we get a plus 2, plus 3, plus 5k. Okay, let's tr try that one quickly again. For i, its minor, minus 12, plus 4, minus 8. For j, minus 4, minus 2 is a minus 6, but we toss in an extra minus, make it a plus 6. For k, plus 2, negative, negative 3, another th plus 3. Looks like we get a plus 5 out of that. So if you agree with that, then I can write up here that uh, this double product is a minus 8i plus 6j plus 5k. Let's do it a couple more times now. What we need is, uh, what I want to eventually wind up with is A cross B cross C. So let's do this one first. B vector minus 3, 1, 0. C vector 1, minus 2, and 4. given my confidence fairly high at this point. Let's see if I can get this thing pretty much done without a lot of writing. This will be i times 4 minus 0, 4i, four a negative j with negative 12, 0. So that gives me a plus 12, I think. And finally, plus k with a plus 6, minus 1, or a plus 5. Let's check it again for i, 4 minus 0. For j, negative 12 minus 0 negated. For k, plus 6 minus 1 gives us a plus 5. Now if I take that and cross it with a. Okay, I want A first, so that's 2, 0, 1. Anybody remember what happens if I get those two switched? What happens if I have mis mistakenly A here and B cross C up here? You get a different sign. It'll be neg a negation of what you wanted. Okay, so let's see how we go. This will be uh, 0 minus 12i negative j times 10 minus 4, that's 6, so I get a negative 6j. And for k, 24 minus 0, I get plus 24k.
And of course, that, uh, if I didn't make a mistake, of course, that's the easy way to make things not equals, make mistakes. But if you've been following carefully, what I have for A cross parens B cross C is way different from parens A cross B crossed with C. So not only do you not have commutativity, you don't have, uh, pardon me, yes, right, commutativity, which we had back here, you don't even have associativity. So cross product is kind of a funny character. Now that's not to say that it's not useful. The things that it represents have the characteristics that are inherent within the cross product. So it's one of those facts of life that not everything in the world is commutative, not everything in the world is associative. That's just the way it goes, so to speak. Well, you're pr pretty much bored, I think, by now, if you've seen this and done some problems yourself with actually computing cross products. What kinds of problems will we run across? Well, there are some hard ones right now in your exercises, and we'll see a couple of easy applications down the road. The hard ones come in a couple of flavors there that I noticed, like in problem 18. I won't actually do 18, but I'll give you the little talk that goes with it. In fact, it's a fairly typical problem. You'll have three points, P, Q, and R in three space. Try to give you that uh, feeling. In it, over here, you have three points in three space. Let's assume that you're looking down into the plane of thing just to make it look good. So really, we're in the plane of these points. looking flat down on it. And a couple of questions that they ask are, well, find a vector which is perpendicular to the plane. Now, that's not too hard. Uh, we just talked about such a creature. If you're given two vectors, then the, uh, I guess we just erased everything. If you're given two vectors, for example, PQ and PR, a vector perpendicular to those, if you say PQ cross P, R. If you want that particular vector, which is as good as any, if you just want a perpendicular, PQ cross PR will be a vector perpendicular to the plane. And in fact, as I just said, down the line is exactly what we're going to use that cross product for, and that is to come up with an equation for that plane. Right now, I'm talking as if you understood this stuff from some intuitive background or maybe from your high school uh, geometry course. But uh, right now, three points determine a plane. There it is, and the cross product does your job. The second question is a little peculiar. I think it says find the area of the triangle. Find the area of that triangle given by those three points. That's the same old situation. Out here in three space is this triangle, how do you climb out onto that triangle and actually take out your tape measure and find out what the dimensions are, the altitude, etc.? That's kind of tough to do. Well, you've heard the story before. It's all wrapped up in doing it correctly with vectors. As it turns out, the area of the triangle is uh, obviously half the area of the, tr the parallelogram there. In fact, that's where many of you probably saw the area for a parallelogram given or for a triangle in terms of having it. And what's the area of that particular parallelogram? Let's put some dimensions on it. Uh, to do that, you'd need your altitude and you'd need your base. Okay, area of the parallelogram, altitude times base. Well, the base is easy. That's the length of the PQ vector. No difficulty there. If you had some trigonometry in high school, your teacher could say, for example, if you take this angle between your two vectors, theta, meaning sound familiar now, that's the opposite side. Uh, let's see now. I'm going to work in this particular right triangle right here. And in that right triangle, you might notice that H is known. Don't confuse B with uh, the other leg because it's really on the 
the, the base of the parallelogram. So I know the opposite side of theta. And in effect, I know the hypotenuse. That would be the length of PR. So I know PR. I know theta. I want the opposite side. Obviously, the sine function springs to mind. And H will be the length of the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle in between. So the area of the parallelogram is base times height, which is length of PQ times length of PR times the sine of the angle in between. Um, should I mention it? That is, in fact, the length of PQ cross PR. So when you're doing your problem, they ask you for the area of the triangle with vertices at three given points. Take one of the points, doesn't make any difference. Form the vector to another point, a vector to the third point, cross those vectors, as we just did using the determinant. Take the length of that cross product, and you've got the area of the parallelogram. The length of the cross product is the area of the parallelogram. If you need the area of the triangle, take half of that. Okay, without being specific, of course, this is the, the rough part right here actually making that computation. But as we've done about four today, I guess, uh, that won't be too bad. And if you take the length of it, usual length, Pythagorean length, you've got the problem solved. <coughs> Questions? So is that the area of the parallelogram? That's the parallelogram. That's this B, length of PQ, times this H, which by trig is hypotenuse uh, sine of theta. So that's the entire parallel parallelogram. That's what's in blue here. The triangle is half the parallelogram, and we can use that if you wish. Now the really tough problem, I think you've got only one of those, is not only tough to explain, it's tough to draw. In fact, you might do better than trying to copy my poor attempts and just look at the book. It's got one in there. What you're looking at is not really my misshapen rectangular box. This thing actually is a, a parallelopiped, which is a kind of like a prism with cross cuts that are at funny angles. All these things are at basically funny angles. There is symmetry there. It's not so obvious from my picture again, but uh, let's just say this, that if you looked at a perpendicular to my base down here, it would look something like that. So it's kind of a box that's shoved off on its side. And uh, for some reason, although I can anticipate some, for example, in chemistry, you might need the volume of a certain uh, shape such as this. For some reason, we need to find the volume. So who wants to uh, help me out on this? I'll uh, give you some ideas. Uh, does anyone happen to know what the volume would be, assuming you had all the numbers possible at, at hand? How would you find the volume of such an object? Let's assume that it is rectangular. If you could shove it over onto its side so it looks a, a little bit more regular. if it were straight up and down perpendicular, what would you use to find the area of that box? H times height times width. Okay. I think from what I heard, basically what it comes down to is the area of the base times the perpendicular height. 
And if it's a rectangular box, perhaps, then it'd be, uh, let's say, width times length. So for a rectangular box, A is width, length, height. And we've done that probably before in your max min problems, et cetera. Now, what we're confronting here is a problem much like this <coughs> parallelogram. In other words, if I straighten this thing up, kind of the same story. Straight up, it's base times height. Even if it's shifted over, it's still base times height. That's kind of entertaining if you, if you remember when you first heard that back in, in high school, I guess. It just doesn't make sense, but actually it turns out to be correct. And that's sort of the same sense here. Even if it's moved over, shoved over, the top's moved over, it's basically the same idea. If I have the area of the base times the actual altitude, h, you will, in fact, have the volume that you seek. Okay, so the same kind of idea works. Now, can someone help me some more? What do you think that a is? What's it supposed to look like? What is it as a plane figure? Over here, I made this thing a purely a rectangular box. Exactly. This thing is not only shoved over, but I've kind of squeezed in the sides as well. I don't really necessarily want a rectangle for the base. Let's assume that it's a parallelogram. Where have you heard that recently? The other side of the board. Come over here. We find that if you have a parallelogram, its area is the length of the cross product. So let's start calling these things something or other. Uh, let's call this vector here A, and let's call this vector back here B. And what I can say is that A is the length of vector A cross vector B. We just did that. Okay, so one thing down, we've got our, our value for A. How about that height? By the way, this might be a little bit of a clue. That height is uh, some scalar multiple of A cross B itself because A cross B as a vector is perpendicular. I got <coughs> wrong A's here, pardon me. Little A cross little B. Little A cross little B is a vector perpendicular to the base, the parallelogram itself. OK, now which scalar multiple is it of little A cross little B? What's it have to do with anything? It has to do with the legitimate height of my solid. In other words, if I call this vector C right here, does that picture right there bring back some memories? What's that distance right there if you're given the vector A cross B and the vector C? What is that? Component, right? What you're looking at there, H, is the component of A cross, the well, other way around, C on A cross B. Now, I want a positive number. Remember, the component can be negative, so I'm going to take absolute values to make sure that comes out to be a positive value. Now, for those that are still a little mystified, forget everything else that's here on this board except this C vector and what I want, which is its shadow on the A cross B vector. Its shadow is the height that I wish. Okay? That's the component. Again, the base of this solid is that area right there. We've got the height. You spin it all together, you've got yourself an answer. Now, there's an easier way to do it than what I've expressed here, but at least I've given you the fundamentals of how this is done by basic vector uh, techniques. How does the problem really come to you, it looks something like this. They'll say, given these four points as being adjacent points to a vertex on a parallelepiped, find the volume. 
And one thing you can do is take these pairs of points as vectors, take the cross product, find the length, and then find the component of C on that cross product. Now, unfortunately, uh, that's not the slickest way to do it. What I've put down here is actually correct. But let's go on and remember what this component was. That area that we're after, pardon me, volume. What I've just come up with is uh, altitude, which is the absolute value, the component on A cross B of C, times the length of A cross B. Now, the reason you've done some of your homework religiously is so that you can probably write down what this first thing is. This component of C on A cross B, do you remember how you got that? It had something to do with what product? Dot, dot product. And if you recall, if it's one vector on another, take that one vector and dot it with a unit in the other's direction. So a lot of your homework problems were just basically doing that operation right there. Remember it was uh, vector v on w. You take v dot w divided by its length. Sorry to mess it up, but maybe it looks more familiar with v's and w's. I take the absolute value of that, make sure it's a positive number. Dot product could be negative. What do I have over here? Length of A cross B. Well, the reason I wanted to push on was to show you that you don't really want to separate those two things off. It's best that you push on and notice that, gee, I didn't even really need that length of A cross B. It cancels anyway. It's a positive value. It cancel out. All I'm left with is actually C dot A cross B. That looks pretty slick. In fact, you can make it even slicker in a previous problem to uh, this set right here. Remember, if you started out with uh, A cross B, you'd have some stuff up here in the first row, I, J, and K. Then you'd put in the A components. And then lastly, the B components. Now, when you dot that with a vector out front, the effect will be just this. And that's probably the slickest one of them all, um, except, and here's where it gets kind of hairy. Maybe I should do this. You're all used to computers. What I need is the absolute value of that 3 by 3 determinant. Because I was supposed to have a positive dot product here, I need a positive determinant when I get done. So the final conclusion is, if you're given three points, pardon me, three vectors, four points, three vectors, A, B, and C, just plant the corresponding components into this determinant properly, take the absolute value, and you're all done. Does it make any difference what order you put them in? I mean, if you flip two of the rows, what happens? Same question I asked just earlier. Changes the sign. But if you take the absolute value, it makes no difference anyway. So again, running the picture real fast by you, if you're given four points as adjacent points to a vertex, form corresponding vectors, that is, find their components, by just taking differences and slap them down into determinant rather haphazardly, figure out what it is, take its absolute value, and you're all done. And that looks, looks a little overwhelming. An awful lot went on to that problem. But uh, what I'm, I think one thing I'm trying to get across is that the end result is rather nice and slick, and you can kind of perhaps feel the power of vectors. This is just maybe your first instance where you've actually used vectors religiously in order to get an answer. I don't see really much any other way that's as easy because you see it's basically, if you know what your definitions are, it's basically a, a three-line definition or derivation, I should say. If you tried to do this some other way, well, I don't know what, actually, take a tape measure, Really, how do you find these various dimensions? It's really a tough problem. But with vectors, it just drops right out. And of course, again, the end result's slick in the sense that once I've told you what to do, of course, you immediately go to this particular computation right here. It's those intermediate steps that I find neat. You know, as a mathematician, that's really kind of where I think the problem gets exciting. Generating answers isn't all that interesting. Okay, well, I've uh, slam dunked dot, product, uh, dot products and cross products enough. 
let me at least get you into that next topic that I wanted to get into. And that's the concept of a line in three space. This is going to seem relatively easy after looking at that. Find equation of line L which passes through a point in three space, x0, y0, z0. Okay, so there's our first condition. Okay, I got that, uh, that point. Now, what else do you need for a line? Something like slope direction more generally. Now, slope is okay in, in two space because uh, you, know, you only got two ways to go. Basically, if you know this angle right here, whatever you want to call it, theta, let's say, if you know that angle, you know what the, which way to go. But you're sitting out here in three space and I say, well, the slope is two. That's not enough information. You got lots of places to go from here. So more generally, you need direction. And we'll do that with vectors, at least to begin with. And one easy way to think of it is that we'll require that the line not only pass through P, but is parallel to some vector. Where the vector comes from, we'll see in some other situations. So let's assume that's our vector A right there. And let's assume that it has components A1, A2, and A3. Now what characterizes this thing that I'm going to draw up here, that is, in two space, what characterized when a point was on a line? What did you usually use? Points on the line, if and only if, what? There was an equation, right, y equals mx plus b or something like that. And that's exactly what we're after here. I'd like to say that a point is on this line, point with general coordinates x, y, z is on that line, if and only if something is true. Well, this is where it gets easy again with vectors, because as soon as I see a couple of points these days, I guess I'm getting paranoid, I think of a vector. Now, this one has a fixed, given initial point, kind of a variable terminal point. Now, what's true about that vector that I just drew and the vector that we were given to begin with? Same direction, basically, or opposite direction. Don't forget that I may be interested in a, another point back here, which I obviously will be, in which case the direction would be opposite but either the same or opposite direction, which is translated as what? One word. Parallel. P is on the line if and only if the vector P, let's call this P0, P0, P, the given to the new vector is parallel, let's do it this way, parallel to A. Okay, sorry for that quick uh, extra letter, but uh, that's the fixed point, P0. New point, P, that vector is going to be parallel to A, either same direction or opposite. Of course, they don't have to be anything in terms of lengths. What does parallel mean? Well, we've talked about it. It turns out that that means that really one vector is a scalar multiple of the other. To be parallel means that one has to be a multiple of the other, T, some scalar. And what does that mean in terms of components? Well, what's P0P? We talked about that. What's the vector from one point to another? We have in specifics. You just take the differences of the coordinates. That means that x minus x0i plus y minus y0j plus z minus z0k is t 
times A. That would be TA1I plus TA2J plus TA3K. That was more than I bargained for, but that's what the equality comes down to. On the left is P0P, on the right is TA. And when are two vectors equal? You tell me. How can two vectors be equal? Same magnitude and direction in terms of components, when are they equal? What would have to be true? You see? This vector equals that one. What's that tell me about the components? Have to be equal all the way across. Two vectors are equal, means the components have to be equal. And that's what I wanted. X minus X zero has to be TA one. Y minus Y zero has to be TA two. And Z minus Z zero has to be TA three. That is not the equation that I'm after. That's the set of parametric equations that I use to establish when a point is on a line specified by a given point and a given direction. Run out of time today. We'll come back tomorrow and look at some more specifics. Thanks. This chapter 14, I think we've met our primary goal, and that is to learn how to manipulate basic operations with respect to vectors. That is, we've talked about vector addition, subtraction, uh, scalar multiplication, scalar product, and the vector product. So given a couple of vectors and some numbers, you can do an awful lot with them. Now what we've looked at in terms of those manipulations have been both the geometry with respect to the operation and in fact, how you execute the operation by some algebraic equation or what have you. We had these uh, vector product determinants, so to speak, to help us do that kind of thing. The rest of the chapter, and as you'll get into Calculus 3, you'll see it even more, the rest of the chapter is devoted more towards how can we look at objects in three dimensions and properly describe them or manipulate them using these vector tools. And as we started out last time, the first topic we came across was that of, a, I guess, the simplest thing you could think of in three space. That's a straight line. What we did last time was derive the equation for a straight line. I'll show you what, what was going on there. It came down to saying, well, here's a point, P0 with coordinates x0, y0, z0. And you'd like to talk about a line that has a direction given by a vector A with some general components. So again, we're given a point. We're given a vector for direction. And we were supposed to come up with an equation for the line passing through that point with that direction. What it came down to was saying that that point on the line that's supposed to be general, and let's give the line a name L, the point P with general equation or coordinates x, y, z is on the line if and only if, and the derivation was the vector from P0 to P was parallel to the A vector, which after a, a few operations came down to the following, 
x minus x0 was a1t, y minus y0 is a2t, and z minus z0 is a3t. For t, some scalar, some number that is, between minus and plus infinity. That describes the line L, algebraically. Now what we hope to do shortly, just give you a little bit of a preview while we're, we're still here, what we would like to do is also talk about a plane eventually that passes through, uh, wrong point, but passes through a point and has a given normal vector. And that'll be the next topic we come up, up with. Let's go ahead and look at some problems related to the line. I guess we have about four or five here to, that I wanted to take a look at. First ones, well, all of them are on page 653. But the first one's number six. That's a nice, easy one to start out with. What they do is they give you a point, as I've been doing here, and a direction vector. So this is exactly what we were just talking about. We have a point in three space. And the point in question has five units out here in the x direction for its x coordinate. Y coordinate is zero and z coordinates are minus two. So our point P zero lies down here under the xy plane, a couple of units. The A vector points in the direction of minus i added with minus 4j added with 1k. And as I do that, I'm literally taking minus i, adding it to a negative 4j, adding that to a plus k, and that gives me my direction vector, which is pointing out back in that direction. So that's out there back behind the blackboard we're pointing at. So obviously the line that we want is going to look something like this if you believe the story up till now. This is the line that we're interested in. Now let me go through the derivation of this equation with some specific numbers. Maybe you'll appreciate it a bit more. What we want to do is say that some point P with coordinates x, y, and z is on the line if and only if a couple of things are true. A couple of things can be basically reduced to a vector equation. Go something like this. P with coordinates x, y, z is on the line if and only if. Well, like we talked about last time, let me make P0 the initial point for this vector, P0 to P. And what would have to be true, as I just said, is that the two vectors would have to be parallel. Now, that doesn't mean they're in the same direction, maybe opposite directions. If P were down here, of course, it'd be a negative value. If and only if P0, P is parallel to my direction vector A. What does that mean in terms of vectors? It means that one of the vectors, say P0, P, is some scalar multiple of the vector A. To be parallel means that one vector is some scalar multiple of the other. Either we shrink it, stretch it, or turn it in the other direction. But basically, every point constitutes a vector which in some scalar sense looks like A. In this specific problem, let's, let's see what we have here. P0, P, let me put down my coordinates here. P0 had coordinates 5, 0, minus 2. So P0, P would be the vector whose x component is x minus 5. Okay, we've done this before, displacement vector. The y, or pardon me, the j component would be y minus 0. The k component would be a z minus a minus 2. The 
Okay, that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side says we're supposed to take t times a. So that would be t times the vector which was given to us. Let me go at i, j, k notation, minus i, minus 4j, plus k. Well, if you're talking about scalar multiplication, your homework problems, as I just said, where you're getting used to those new operations, would say you just multiply through each component. Multiply through by the scalar, minus t here, minus 4t here, plus t over there. And for two vectors to be equal, you're going to have to have equal components. The i components have to be equal, j components have to be equal, and the k components have to be equal. So the last statement almost is the statement of those equalities. x minus 5 is minus t, y minus 0 is minus 4t, and z plus 2 is, well, let's, well, let me leave it the way it was, z minus a minus 2 is supposed to be t. So let's look at the top and bottom result. The point P is on the line if and only if the coordinates for P satisfy these three equations, so-called parametric equations, where T can be any number between minus and plus infinity. Now this reminds me again of a couple of derivations we did in class yesterday. That was area of a parallelogram or a triangle in three space, area of a parallelopiped. All the intermediate steps really are not really worth anything after we're done. This is what we wanted. We used vector techniques, but in a sense they disappear in the background. And what we've come up with is, as promised, just a set of equations. And this is where most of your homework is all about. You basically will say, OK, they gave me the point with coordinates 5, 0, and minus 2. And they gave me a direction vector with components minus 1, minus 4, 1. You just simply plug them into those equations, which uh, is nice from your point of view. You don't have to think about it. You just plug and chug. It's one of those real basic problems. But I just wanted you to see where those equations came from, kind of a slick vector derivation. But nonetheless, there's the final answer, as I promised. x minus the uh, x coordinate for p, same for y and z. Here are the components for the a vectors, a1, a2, a3. So as promised, that's what you get. Again, any questions on that? That's probably the most basic kind of a problem that you run across. In other words, it's exactly what I asked for, a direction vector and a point on the line. Now, all the other problems you have are various uh, spin-offs from that particular topic. For example, if I asked you what determined a line, what would be your initial reaction. I think from plane geometry, it's two points to determine a line. And so some of your problems are that type. For example, number two there on 653. And, well, this isn't going to be terribly difficult, but not all of your problems are just plain plug and chug. You will have to be somewhat creative. The creativity will have to come from what you've learned and practiced in your homework up till now. That is, you're going to have to know something more about vectors other than just if someone gives you two vectors and asks, asks you to add them, you know how to add them. It's going to be up to your knowledge to know when to add, subtract, etc. Now, in this problem, let's see what we've got. Well, we've got two points. Don't know that the picture is necessary, but let's see what we do have. Point one, we come out or back three units in the x direction, one unit in the y direction, and minus a unit in the z direction. So there we have P1. P2, seven units in the x direction. 
11 units in the y direction, it's way the heck over here somewhere, and minus 8 units in the z direction, so let's assume it's down there. Okay, so there's your, your pair of points, and we're looking for straight line, it says here, passing through those two points. Okay, time to get creative. What do we have to have? According to the formula, anyway. Anybody? What do we need? Complete silence. What do we need for a line? Need a point? Slope. slope. Well, slope's no good anymore. Need a direction. I mean, let's, let's face it, if you're really desperate, you go back to some formula, and this is the one we'll come back to. And what we needed for that formula <coughs> was a point on the line and some direction vector for the line. So basically, all your problems come back to that formula. And that's where it gets creative. You've got to create either the point or the direction vector. Now over here, you actually have a choice of two points. Which one do you want to pick? Or you can pick another one if you wish, but at least these two are given to you. What's going to be P0 for us? Anybody? P1? Okay. That's, I mean, it really doesn't make any difference. So my P0 will be the point with minus 1, 1, and minus, pardon me, minus 3, 1, and minus 1 for its coordinates. So we've got that. Now, how about a direction vector? <coughs> Got to have one of those things. Where are we going to come up with a direction vector? There isn't a whole lot given to you, so there isn't a whole much to choose from. Yes? Good enough. Well, again, like I say, you've got to know something about vectors here. Let's, uh, let's try to draw it in here first. That, if you have two points, is basically the direction you want to go. So I realize that's not at the origin, but like we've been talking about, this is a free vector world. There's your direction vector, A. Happens to be the vector P1, P2. So for this particular problem, then, let's see, we've got P0. And the vector A would be gotten as the vector that displaces P1 to P2. And what's that going to look like? Let's put it up here on top. If you're going from P1 to P2, then you take the P2 coordinates, subtract the P1 coordinates. That's just what we did here. So what we would have here is 7 minus a minus 3, or 10i plus 11 minus 1, another 10j, plus minus 8 plus 1, which is a minus 7, times k. So there you have it. You've got your direction vector as a displacement from P1 to P2. You've got a point. You pick P1, that's fine. It doesn't make much difference. And now you can basically plug it in your equation over here. I hope that you don't really have to sit there and memorize the equation. It basically comes down to taking the components here against t and equating them to x minus the coordinates over here. Maybe we can sneak it in right down here. x minus x0, which is a minus 3, is supposed to be a1, which is 10 times t, etc. So again, these are the coordinates of P0, and these are the components of the direction vector. And that should do the job. Uh, by the way, before we go on to the next problem, I would at least check to see if P2 is on my, on my line. Obviously, if t equals 0, x equals minus 3, y equals 1, z equals minus 1. That means P1 is on my line. Or pardon me, P0, P1, the same thing. 
But how about P2? Is that going to be on my line? P2 had coordinates 7, 11, and 8. What you should do is check to see what that means for the t-value. For example, uh, P2 x-coordinate of 7 gives me a 10 on this side. That's 10t on the right. That means t has to equal 1. So apparently, when t equals 0, you're at P0. When t equals 1, perhaps we're at P2. Check it out. Put 1 in here. 10 equals y minus 1, y equals 11. Okay, that checks. That's the y coordinate for P2. T equal 1 in here, minus 7 equals z plus 1. z equals minus 8. That checks there too. So you've got it. In other words, there's no way you can be wrong here. Both P1 and P2 are in these equations, and these are equations of a straight line. It's got to be the, the right one. So there's no real mumbo jumbo, but uh, not all of them are as trivial as they might first appear. For example, number 11, same page. Not only is this one difficult to draw, it's probably going to be difficult to basically discuss. What we're supposed to do is find the angle between a couple of lines. Now, I won't try to even be uh, representative of what's really the, the pair of lines, but maybe here's a line coming out at us, and here's yet another line going back in that direction, let's say. Let's say this is L2 and L1. Now, what they're asking you for is the angle between the two lines. Well, I think right now, I th most of you would be hard-pressed to even describe what the angle would be in terms of words, because those things may not even intersect. If they intersected, you might have some a chance of talking about that angle, but they don't even do that. And so I guess what I'll have to do is trot out what the, the book suggests you do, and that is realize that angle between the two lines is supposed to be the angle between a couple of direction vectors for the two lines. So this might be the direction vector A1 for L, and this might be the direction vector for L2. And I plant both those vectors with their common initial points at the origin. So take any direction vector for both, and the angle between those direction vectors is the angle in question. Angle between two lines is the angle between their direction vectors. Okay, well, that's the definition. Now let's see if we can do the problem. The lines in question are these. Let's call that L1. And let's call L2 the second set. Now, of course, this problem, I hope you realize, is backwards to what we've been doing up until now. That is, we've basically been given some geometry, and we were to come up with some equations. Well, now, here are the equations, and basically, you're to come up with the geometry. You're to come up with an angle between the two lines. Well, we're not having too much luck, but I'll try it one more time. Uh, anybody have any suggestions as to, for example, coming up with the vector a1 here? How can I look at an equation for a line and come up with a direction vector? Notice it's not unique. If whatever you come up with, you double it by 2, it's still going to be a direction vector. We're not really worried about magnitude, just the direction. OK, so what am I going to put down here? A1, direction vector for line 1, what do we put down? 
minus 2 for what? For the i component. Okay, you seem to be on, a, on the right idea. Okay. Plus 3j, and I'll bet he'll say 5k. And why did you get that? Well, it's not in exactly the same form as before, but look at it this way. This is x minus 7 equals um, minus 2 times t. And so what he's saying is that this is an x-coordinate for a point on this line, and that's the i-component for a direction vector for that line. Again, we waltz back here to the basic equation. What's in front of the t's when you get it in the right form turns out to be good enough components. So you just basically strip off those coefficients of t for your components for a1. Same thing for a2. What we have over there is 1i plus 4j plus 1t, uh, pardon me, k from the 1t. So I've got both my vectors. What am I going to do for the angle between? How are you going to find out what theta is? Again, use the dot product. As we found out, the dot product by definition, geometric definition, is the length of A1, length of A2, cosine of the angle in between. So in other words, theta would be the inverse cosine of the dot product, okay, we can do that pretty easily, minus 2 plus 12 plus 5, divided by the length of A and also by the length of A2, A1 and A2. This would be minus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared. Take the square root. Second vector, similar story. Well, I think we're close enough to quit, particularly since I'm not sure all those numbers are all that great. But there is an answer. Take out your calculator if necessary and compute the inverse cosine. OK, now, again, not a tremendously tough problem, basically because uh, once you know what the definition was, I think it was pretty easy to figure out what to do to get that definition. But notice that if you hadn't studied dot product, even if I told you it was an angle between two vectors, uh, what would you do then? You'd really be kind of stuck for some kind of uh, numerical computation of that particular item. So that's what I mean about being creative. You still have to know all those tools in order to use the right one at the right time. OK, I think the last problem is somewhat similar. And take a look at it, maybe kind of a review problem here. This is number 11. Again, we're given two lines. Oh, that is number 11, pardon me. Just did it. What we want is 18. OK, here are the two lines. And the only difference here is that rather than use t, we'll use a v as our parameter. Now what you're supposed to do is show that the two lines are perpendicular and intersect. So out there in three space, One of these lines, let's say, comes out towards us. Another line goes back away from us. But the angle of intersection is 90 degrees. And in fact, there is a point of intersection. You're supposed to show that that's the case.
Now, let's think about it. If this is going to be a common point of intersection on, let's say, uh, what do we call them, line one and line two, then there has to be, since we're on line one at this green point, there has to be a value t at that point, which simultaneously corresponds to a v value from the second set of equations. In other words, there has to be a time t for the first line and a time v for the second line. So at that particular pair of values, t and v, you have the same x-coordinates. Okay, same x-coordinates, not x, but same coordinates, same point coordinates. for some t and v. Well, now it becomes an algebraic problem. For example, uh, look down here. z equals v would mean that up here, z would have to be 4 plus 3t. Okay? So v, if the z's are going to be the same, v would have to be 4 plus 3t. Now, what you can do is look at another pair, for example, the y pair, minus 1 minus t is y, and that equals minus 1 plus v. That comes from the y pairs. Well, if that's going to be the case, then if you see that v is equal to 4 plus 3t, minus 1 minus t would be y, which is minus 1 plus this v that I had up here. Solving away, let's see, we'll get 4t on the right if I take the t over there. Here's a 3, looks like a minus 4 over here. Looks like t equals minus 1. If it's going to work, t will be minus 1, and from up above, v would be a uh, 4 plus 3 times minus 1, or a plus 1. Again, I'm running a little short of time. Let me say that I checked it out. Those numbers do work. If you plug the Vn of plus 1, T of minus 1, you will, in fact, get the same XYZ coordinates. So the lines do intersect. How about perpendicular? Anybody have any suggestions to wrap up the problem? What's that mean, perpendicular? Something about dot product equals 0. We've talked about that. So quickly, you would find from the proper coefficients Direction vectors for L1 and L2 take the dot product. If it's zero, they're perpendicular. Again, I don't want to run through that, but uh, looking at these coefficients of t and v, you can write down the two vectors, take the dot product. In fact, you'll find that they're zero. Okay, go ahead and do your homework problems. I don't think you'll find anything that's much more complicated than that. What we'll do next time is get into the next topic, as promised, and that is. Uh, more of a two-dimensional object in three space, the plane. And after that, we start talking about more exciting things, surfaces and various shapes and sundry things. So uh, it's coming, the interesting stuff, but uh, we still have to get the, the so-called easy stuff behind us first. We'll see you next time then.